Hello students, in this session we will discuss about more about Carnot cycle. So as we have seen, a Carnot cycle is considered to be the most efficient reversible cycle or reversible heat engine. Well you can see it starts from a temperature and undergoes isothermal expansion. So you can see in the diagram it undergoes an isothermal expansion that is the volume um, uh, builds up, volume get expanded while pressure will reduce and it will be undergoing isothermal in the sense keeping constant temperature and in the process heat will be absorbed from a hotter reservoir and once it it completes isothermal expansion it will then undergo an adiabatic expansion and from the name suggests adiabatic means there is no exchange of heat happening so it will be just expanding as such but as there is no heat exchange the temperature will be varying so from a high temperature it will be varying to the low temperature theta 2 then after that it will undergo an isothermal compression where the heat will be given out to the Calder reservoir and in the process it will be maintaining same temperature as it is undergoing isothermal compression and then it will complete the cycle by undergoing an adiabatic compression where the temperature will then uh, return back to the early case th 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 that is represented in the diagram. So, this could be pictorially represented as follows you can see a high temperature hot reservoir is supplying energy heat energy to the system and some part of the energy will be converted into work and the remaining part and water be um, absorbed or the remaining part is given to the cold reservoir uh, and in the process the system is in the same initial state so and this is how a Carnot cycle works so you can imagine it using a piston and a container so initially the container the bottom of the container is susceptible to the heat transfer so it will let in the heat energy so corresponding to that it will undergo a isothermal expansion so the piston will move up then it is um, kept in contact with an insulator so no heat is going out uh, so it will undergo adiabatic expansion then after that it is made in contact with a uh, conducting uh, base so that what happens whatever be the heat energy that will flow out so it will the piston will move down and after that it is in contact with an insulator where there is no heat exchange only the uh, temperature is getting changed to the initial temperature and in the process the volume is also getting uh, compressed so it is called adiabatic compression so this cycle will repeat and repeat over and over again forming Carnot cycle so we'll see many ki uh, different kinds of uh, Carnot engines like composite engines so in this picture you can see there is an irreversible engine which means um, it is operating in a forward direction that is it is taking the heat q1 prime from the hotter reservoir and giving out some work and remaining heat energy is given to the colder reservoir while this work given out by the irreversible engine is taken up by a Carnot cycle or Carnot engine uh, and in the process what will it do it will reverse the process that is heat energy will be taken out from the colder reservoir to the hotter reservoir that is how a Carnot engine works uh, backward will affect the system okay so whatever be the work given out by the irreversible engine is taken up by the Carnot engine working in backward direction so that it will be transferring heat energy from colder to the hotter okay 
so that is what the that is the example mentioned here as composite engine so a reversible engine produces work which drives the Carnot engine backward so that is the case for a refrigerator so it means no work is done on the rest of the universe so the efficiency of irreversible engine is given by eta i which is work given out divided by the energy that is inputted that is q q1 prime and efficiency of reversible engine eta r is equal to work that is taken in divided by q1 that is the input that is for the normal case okay so uh, in this session we will prove that there is no reversible irreversible machine efficient than a Carnot machine so we are considering the same example of a composite engine so let us consider if um, for the time being let us consider the irreversible engine is more efficient so then what would be that mean it means the eta i must be greater than eta r so that is possible only if the denominators of irreversible that is q1 prime has to be smaller for that so that the eta is greater okay so which implies q1 prime that is the heat taken out of the hotter reservoir is less than the heat given to the hotter reservoir okay so heat out of the hotter reservoir is less than heat into the hotter reservoir so that means something more is taken from some other reservoir in this case a called a reservoir and it is given to the hotter reservoir isn't it so water being taken out is not given to the q1 okay q1 is more than q1 prime which implies there is some extra energy being taken out from the colder reservoir and then given to the hotter reservoir if we consider irreversible engine to be more efficient okay that is what the, this statement implies okay so is that possible is that possible uh, for a heat energy to to be uh, flowing from a colder to a hotter one no it is so it is against what we see in the universe that is it is contrary to the closest um, statement of second law of thermodynamics where he mentioned without any influence from the rest of the universe um, you cannot take out heat energy from a colder to a hotter reservoir okay so if you consider this composite engine as a single unit no work is taken out or take uh, taken from the universe or no effect is given to the universe so in the absence of an external influence it is not possible that heat energy can be taken from a colder to a hotter so which implies q1 cannot be greater than q1 prime so which means q1 prime is greater or the efficiency of irreversible is smaller so that is our conclusion any irreversible engine is less efficient than a carnot engine okay so the no engine operating between two reservoirs can be more efficient than a Carnot engine operating between the same two reservoirs always the Carnot engine will be the most efficient one okay so if you consider now if we consider two reversible engines two Carnot engines are taken up for the uh, as example then if you consider uh, q1 prime is not equal to q1 that is whatever be the heat taken is not given back to the uh, reservoir so if you consider in that way heat out of the hot reservoir is not equal to the heat into the hotter reservoir so this also implies that heat would have to flow from colder to the hotter body with no external work done 
okay it, in either way q1 prime can be greater or q1 can be greater so in whatever it be it implies that heat is getting flowed from a colder region to a hotter region that is again against the uh, closer statement of second law of thermodynamics heat can only transfer from a hotter to a colder um, reservoir unless it is acted by a um, an external influence okay so which implies q1 prime has to be equal to q1 so what does that mean the efficiency of here it should be reversible efficiency of the first carnot cycle carnot engine is same as the efficiency of the second carnot engine so efficiency of a reversible engine is already been taken as eta is equal to we have mentioned it that is eta is equal to work done by the heat taken that is q1 so work done is the difference between how much it is taken and how much it is given out so it is q1 minus q2 divided by q1 so from that after cancellation you have the efficiency for a single Carnot engine is given by 1 minus q2 by q1 so that depends only on what will be the temperature between theta 1 and theta 2 it doesn't matter whichever Carnot engine you use you will always get the same efficiency only thing is that it depends only on what is the temperature theta 1 and theta 2 so our inference from this statement is that the q2 by q1 that is heat energy given out to the heat energy taken by the system will be just a function of what will be the temperature of hot reservoir and the cold reservoir okay so any two reversible engines operating between the same two temperatures have the same efficiency so whatever be the heat that is taken out or given in will depend just on the temperature alone okay so now let us consider the two Carnot engines in a different way that is uh, whatever be the heat taken out from first heat bar theta 1 some part is uh, given out as work and remaining portion is portion of heat energy is given to the another heat bath at temperature theta 2 at an amount q2 and this heat energy is taken by the next Carnot cycle and a uh, work is done and the remaining part is given to the third heat bath which is at a temperature theta 3 so here we are considering three heat baths theta 1, theta 2 and theta 3. So the heat that flows into the thermal reservoir theta 2 passes directly to the second Carnot cycle. That is the feature here. So you can see if you consider the second Carnot cycle Q2, the ratio of Q2 to Q3 must be a function of the temperature of second heat bath that is theta 2 and the temperature of third heat bath theta 3. So, thus the two Carnot cycle can be together be considered as a single reversible Carnot engine. So, in that case if you consider this as a single unit the energy taken out is Q1 and heat energy that is given is Q3. So, you can take the ratio as Q1 to Q3 can be written in terms of Q1 to Q2, Q1 to Q2, then ratio from Q2 to Q3, which will again will give Q1 to Q3 after cancellation of Q2. Okay, so in terms of function, I can write it as a function dependent on theta1 and theta3 will be equal to for q1 to q2 i can write it as a function depend on q theta 1 and theta 2 and for q2 to q3 i can write a function depending on theta 2 to theta 3 theta 2 and theta 3 okay but these function must take the form a function of theta 1 and to the function of theta 2 it must be completely separable into a numerator part 
depending upon theta 1 alone and the denominator part depending on theta 2 alone so that f of theta 2 and theta 3 can similarly be represented as a function depending upon theta 2 alone and denominator is given by function depending upon theta 3 alone. So that why do we have to write in that way? Because then only if you take the product of these two functions theta 2 in the denominator and theta 2 in the numerator will cancel off. So finally you will get um, function of theta 1 to function of theta 3 which is our q1 to q3. Okay, q1 to q3 must contain only a function of theta 1 and theta 3 which means theta 2 has to be eliminated. So that is possible only if you represent the, this function as a function depending on theta 1 alone in the numerator and theta 2 alone in the denominator. Okay? That's how we write the function. Okay. So conclusion is that the ratio of heat energy which is written as a function of the temperatures of the reservoir can be written as a function of the first reservoir in the numerator divided by a function of the second uh, temperature of second reservoir. Okay, it is completely separable. Okay, so the ratio of functions of ratio of heat energy is equivalent to ratio of functions of respective temperature of the reservoirs. Okay, so that is our conclusion. So thus, Kelvin suggested absolute temperature based on this concept. So he include that an absolute temperature is a function of theta. What is theta? Theta is the temperature of the perfect gas. So let's see how it is possible. So the ratio of heat flows in Carnot cycle is given by Q1 by Q2 and we have seen it is same as function of theta 1 in the numerator divided by function of theta 2 in the denominator. And according to the Kelvin, it can be give equivalent to T1 by T2 which T1 and T2 are the absolute temperature of first reservoir and second reservoir respectively. So by knowing a reference temperature, Carnot cycle can be used as a thermometer if we could measure the heat flows in a cycle. That is, if you know the ratio of the heat that is taken out and given to the reservoirs in a Carnot cycle and if you know one of the reference temperature, so the other temperature can be calculated. So in that sense, a Carnot cycle can be used as a thermometer. Okay, but that kind of thermometer is impractical only because we cannot build a truly reversible Carnot cycle. A truly reversible Carnot cycle is not there in reality. So we cannot stick on with such a thermometer. So what kind of thermometer is reliable? Yeah, it is a constant volume gas thermometer is considered to be the most accurate one for measuring temperature. Why that so? We'll see it. So we'll establish an equivalence of absolute temperature that is T and the perfect gas scale of temperature that is theta. Earlier we have only expressed that it is just a function of theta. Earlier case we have seen that absolute temperature was written as a just a function of theta. But now we are going to establish that it is not a function but the theta itself. So how do you do that? Let's see. For that, let us consider the Carnot cycle itself. Carnot cycle consisting of a perfect gas and which goes around a cycle consisting of two isothermal process. So one isothermal starting with, let me mark it as A from A point to the B point. You have the first isothermal expansion then from B to C you have adiabatic expansion. From C to D you have isothermal compression. Then D to A it completes a cycle with an adiabatic compression. So twice it is undergoing isothermal effects or the isothermal process. So what is the implication of an isothermal process? Here the temperature is constant 
while the heat can flow in or flow out. So in the first section, A to B, which is undergoing isothermal expansion, heat is getting into the system. So for a perfect gas, we know and internal energy depends only on the temperature and number of, number of moles of gas present. So if there is no temperature change because it is isothermal, there is no temperature change involved which means internal energy is zero for an isothermal process. So considering that we have the equation for heat energy that is D cross Q for a reversible process is given by du plus PTV but for an isothermal process du is equal to zero so it is just equal to pressure into dv okay now you can calculate what is the total heat added in the isothermal stage that is given by from integrating from a to b p dv so for an ideal gas equation we know p is given by nr theta since we are considering q1 you will consider theta 1 here so nr theta 1 divided by volume is integrated from Va to Vb which is the volume at A point to the B point. Okay. So you will get just 1 by V is natural log of Vb minus natural log of Va which is just the property of logarithm. You can write it as natural log of Vb by Va. So we got the expression for heat total heat added during the process a to b okay now we'll consider the second isothermal stage which is happening from c to d okay from c to d is the next process but in this case the heat energy is given out so you have a negative sign because it is given out so from the process we are integrating from c to d p dv with a negative sign now negative sign can be given to the integral so the integral will get uh, reversed and it is written as from volume vd to vc and writing down the ideal gas equation will uh, substitute for p as n r theta 2 theta 2 corresponding to q2 divided by volume is integrated so then you get n r theta 2 natural log of vc by vd so uh, we have the ratio of heat flows we have already calculated that q1 by q2 will be equal to the absolute temperature t1 divided by t2 or which is equal and equal to we have found out just found out that q1 is given by theta1 nr theta1 natural log vb by va divided by nr theta2 natural log vc by vd so nr is uh, cancelled out so you have the relation as such now we need to omit the temperatures so for that let us consider the adiabatic process for an adiabatic process we already know uh, temperature into volume raised to gamma minus 1 will be a constant so uh, that was seen in our last session so you can see that for an adiabatic process happening at theta 1 to theta 2 the volume change would be Vb to Vc. So then it would be theta 1 Vb raised to gamma minus 1 is equal to theta 2 Vc raised to gamma, gamma minus 1. Similarly, you can write for these two cases that is from theta to D volume D we are going to theta 1 volume a during adiabatic compression so you can write it as theta 1 va raised to gamma minus 1 is equal to theta 2 vd raised to gamma minus 1 now taking the ratio of these two equations you have theta 1 will cancel off theta 2 will cancel off you just have this ratio of the volume now you can taking the logarithm you'll get natural log vb by va is equal to natural log vc by vd so we have seen we can see that we can um, substitute back into the previous expression so q1 by q2 will be just equal to this is same as 
this part so that will cancel out so it is just theta 1 by theta 2 along so what is our con uh, uh, conclusion absolute the ratio of absolute temperature is same as the ratio of perfect gas temperature which is theta okay so the absolute temperature is proportional to the perfect gas temperature or you can say if you take the proportionality constant as unity absolute temperature is same as you know, perfect gas temperature for the time being okay so kelvin has expressed uh, the temperature scale, scale using the concept of absolute uh, temperature so what he have used you would have noticed in celsius scale there are two fixed points the lower point is given by zero degree celsius and um, higher most is given by 100 degree celsius so it was fixed as uh, zero degree as freezing point of water and 100 degree celsius it is the temperature required for boiling boiling of water but later on it was seen that uh, you could go beyond the freezing point of water you could get negative values of temperature so in order to avoid the negative values kelvin came up with a different notation he used the fixed points as absolute zero of temperature that is zero kelvin which is the temperature uh, which corresponds to the zero moment of molecule okay which means uh, he considered the temperature as a measure of how much energy the atom or the molecule is having okay so it, the energy can be expressed only in a positive scale since the energy cannot be negative so he also used the temperature scale in a with the positive values alone starting with zero kelvin so absolute zero of temperature is the temperature in a system where all the particles stop moving it doesn't have any internal energy at all okay that is how he defined the kelvin temperature zero kelvin and the next fixed point is a triple point of water which is given by 273.1 kelvin which is the uh, temperature at which the three phases of water will coexist in thermodynamic equilibrium okay so that is how uh, kelvin proposed the absolute temperature and you have seen how an equivalence can be made between the absolute temperature and the perfect gas temperature so now you can make use of this absolute temperature for constructing an entropy so that will be seen in our next session thank you